We're back. Think Tech is back. Welcome back. And today we're doing Community Community Matters. We're going to talk about a book that was written about our community, a special slice, actually many slices of, um, you know, the history of Hawaii. And, and uh, I'll talk more about this. We'll talk more about it with uh, Shane Marshall Goodsill, who's an author who wrote a book just coming out, Voices of Hawaii. We're going to listen to those voices through Jane. It's a very interesting way of looking at, at Hawaii. Hawaii is a special place, special culture, special history, different from other places. And that's one of the great strengths of the state. And Jane has analyzed that she, you know, one on one. She's done interviews of, oh, gee, it looks like hundreds of people for hundreds of hours. And then she's capsulized that into a book covering you know, a lot of subjects that, that define Hawaii. What made you do this, Jane? You know, Jane, before I answer that question, I wanna say something else. I wanna say, this is my second interview with you and I loved it so much. It was so easy to talk to you. And, <laughs> you know, since I've taken hundreds of hours of interviews, it was so nice to be on the other end and to be the one interviewed. So <laughs> mahalo for that. It's really yeah, nice. well, it was a great discussion. And um, as I recall, you were just getting around to, you know, putting that book together, you know, binding it up, so to speak. And now it's bound. Now it's ready. Now it's out there. And uh, I wanted to come back. I wanted to circle back with you because I think the, you know, the, the lessons of the last, what, six or eight months since we spoke um, are, you know, really profound. Um, and I'm sure you have coalesced your thinking. That's what I want to capture today. <laughs> well, the collecting of the data was really fun because you never knew from moment to moment who you'd be talking to and what story they'd be telling you. So that was really thrilling. Then after that, I had to get every interview transcribed. And uh, then I had to go through and edit them and make them readable. Then I had to share them with the people to see if they liked what I had come up with. And unanimously they did and they all participated and responded, can you imagine? 75 people all responding via email and snail mail to the back and forth. So it was a cooperative effort between me and every single person who participated in this. Well, you know, we favor, we uh, extol the virtues of citizen journalists. And I think that you have those virtues. You are a citizen journalist. You start out of curiosity and, um, and then you reach out to people and and they respond because they know you're genuine. Um, and then you, you find the truth in what they have to say. You find value in uh, kind of everyone you talk to. And, and then you go to the trouble of putting it all together. That is quite remarkable. I would wear that uh, as a badge of honor to be a citizen journalist. I love that idea. Yeah, we do. We, uh, we, we love our citizen and, journalists. And you know, after the last interview, you said when I was talking about how I would go and talk to people and then amazing things would come out that I hadn't pre-planned. You said, that's what we do. That's what we do all day. And I thought, yes, same, same. Yeah. yeah. And, so, and really, if you, if you have a nice relationship and in the course of the discussion, amazing things, surprises, profundities, they just showered upon you. <laughs> yes, I agree. And I did not start this project expecting to write a book, that was not my goal. It's just that the tidbits of information, archival information about Hawaii and the things that happened during the formative years from about 1941 to about 2000 were just too rich. I just couldn't not use them. And everybody was happy for me to use them. They said, they gave me full legal uh, authorization. Please use this. Yes, please. I'd send them my chapter and say, this is what I want your chapter to look like. Oh, fine, great. So are you, are you suggesting that in that period, um, there was a, a special transformation of the islands um, that, um, you know, that is worth studying? And if so, what, what, if you could say now what it is, what it was, what was that transformation? Why is this such an interesting period in history? Not only Hawaiian history, but the history of humanity. Why? here in that period was this so interesting? Well, see now you're requiring me to be probably wiser than I am, but I'll give that a shot. <laughs> um, it was a period uh, 
before World War II, when things were quite different, the jets had not started coming yet. So Hawaii had not become as multicultural as it has become. And uh, it was more, of, as somebody described it, Gary Gill used to always say, it was like a beautiful tropical flower. And everybody wanted to come and everybody wanted to pick the flower. And those of us who live there wanted to keep them from picking the flower. <laughs> come smell it, but don't pick it, right? So uh, that's one of, was one of the themes, uh, preserving the beauty of what we have. Carol Cox talked a lot about that when she talked about preserving the uh, rivers, the Hanalei River from, having, from becoming hydroelectric. Um, um, so anyway, there was that element and then we, statehood occurred and then the jets came and then technology has changed all this time. And I'm talking to the people who lived through all those days and have stories to tell me that go back to their ancestors. Do you remember I, I told you that Oz Stender told me a story that he had some, his grandfather had some property out in the Haula. And do you remember how long I said the lease on that property was? 999 years. Oh, wow. I said, what? I've never heard of a lease that long. Are you sure? He said, yes. I said, was that common? He said, it was back then. <laughs> wow. <laughs> He's an amazing man. And he's one of the, the hundreds of people that you interviewed on this. And he has so much to offer. So, I, don't want you to, I don't want you to go too far. I interviewed 75 people. It felt like hundreds, but it was 75. But it was a very- 75. Rich it goes on for pages and pages. And, and it's, it's a who's who of, uh, you know, in Hawaii. And, you know, it, it has to me uh, a certain, you know, uh, a certain resonance because I know a lot of them. And I've read about a lot of them, and they've they form our our world here, at least in my generation and your generation too. Um, they they are they are the statues along the passage. In the I started hallway. out. I wanted to do the people who were in the older generation, just in case they wouldn't be with us. And sure enough, Mr. Matsuda has died since then, and Carol, uh, not Carol, um, uh, Lois Taylor Clark has died since then. Yeah. Um, but the others are still with us. But I started with the older generation and then people kept telling me who I should interview. And so I would follow the lead and interview them. And I interviewed uh, a couple people who are my own age. And I told them, you know, you don't really fit in here. You're not old enough. Yeah. But they've done such <laughs> remarkable things <laughs> that they fit in. Yeah, that, but th there it is. I mean, it's, it's uh, what I was describing to you before the show. It's uh, spelunking. It's spelunking, you're, you're discovering um, you don't know what's at the end of the passage in the cave, um, but you know you you have to keep a a, a rope, a, a thread to know where you're going and keep your bearings. Um, there's a lot of nostalgia involved. There's a lot of trying to find um, you know familiar pieces that you can recognize, threads, if you will, that you can recognize. So it's a, it's a journey, a discovery, and a rediscovery. Putting it all together. Once I had all these interviews, and I have hundreds of pages of transcripts and each I could have written a book on each person's story because they're all wonderful um, but what I had to do is pull out the parts that were the most salient the parts that somehow spoke to me and I thought might speak to my audience and then I would put that in one part of a chapter and somebody else's information in another part of that same chapter and, and build a chapter on those themes that was fun to do. It took a lot of creativity. And work. You, you said that uh, somewhere you have uh, reproduced uh, the verbatim transcripts of these. In, where is that? Where can I find that? I have all the verbatim transcripts, but I'm not posting them on the people who are still alive until after my book comes out. Call me mercenary, but <laughs> I, first of all, I don't know. I don't know who's going to read other than you. I don't know who's going to sit down and read a long uh, life transcription. Uh, but if you go to my website, voicesofhawaii.com, you'll learn a lot about my project, a lot about me, wonderful pictures, lists of everybody that I've interviewed. And then there's a picture at the end of everybody that I've interviewed. And a few of them who are deceased uh, have the entire transcription already posted. And then a couple of them, I did audio clips of things they said. Jimmy Greenwell is in there. If you click on Jimmy Greenwell, you won't see his transcript, but you'll hear a little story about taking a, a horseback ride with his grandfather. 
one of the funniest parts of that is he said, you know, the kids can't go down the street unless they have a flask of water. We'd go out all day in the dry country on our horses without a sip of water, except for a glass that we drank before we went. And my grandmother would make us these cheese sandwiches. Oh, he said, you try to eat a cheese sandwich when your mouth is dry. <laughs> it was hysterical. So his grandfather would pick him a guava and say, here you go, son, have this. <laughs> Yeah, you've memorialized something. And as the years go by, those interviews and transcripts and this book will be more and more valuable. It's sort of, sort of like the Steven Spielberg Shoah project of the survivors of the Holocaust, where he filmed them, hundreds, thousands of them. And, um, and he, he doesn't release the movie until they die when it becomes, um, you know, a, a more valuable somehow. And it's the same thing here. Uh, as these people die, this book will become more valuable. Um, your transcripts will become more valuable. Uh, and it's, it touches you now, but in the future, to the inquiring mind and student, it will be incredibly valuable to understand exactly how the state has come about. As I fully intend place. to release all of my transcripts at some point in time. I don't feel proprietary about it. And as long as the people I've interviewed are okay, and they've, they've approved, they've read over and approved every single transcript. So uh, I feel okay with that. And my goal is to make them available to researchers in the future. What I like is, uh, is that spelunking thing about one, one person sort of connects you with the next person and your curiosity takes over um, and you're, you know, you're, it never stops. You, you keep on going and whatever touches you, you go in that direction and then that direction. Oh, it was after... fun. It was fun. So I'll give you an example of that. Uh, Duncan McNaughton is a family friend of my family. My, his father and my father were friends together. So I go up and I talk to Duncan and Duncan's, you know, a half a generation older than I am. And so, you know, we were never, we never sat down and had a conversation before, but we sat and talked for a couple of hours and it was so much fun. He can tell a great story. And then he said, you know, I said, who else should I interview, Duncan? He was, he was like number 10 on my list. And uh, he said, well, maybe you should talk to Jeff Watanabe. And I said, okay. So I said, you know him when you make the introduction? He went, sure. So then uh, I go talk to Jeff and he gave me a completely different perspective on, you know, I don't know if you know Jeff, but he has a different view on the world. Uh, than the one that I grew up with. So it was so interesting. I love that interview. Just sitting in the room with him was exciting. And thus it was with everybody I spoke to. I told you I spoke to Judge Paget, And the reason I spoke with him is that he had a professor at uh, Harvard Law School that my father had also. And so I said to him, tell me what brought you to Hawaii and how it relates to this trust uh, uh, lawyer professor that you had. He said, well, that's how it all began. There are a lot of trusts in Hawaii, personal trust and ali'i trust and property and trust. And he said, this is how the ali'i preserved their um, heritage for their people. So um, that's what brought him, trust law. Yeah. And you and I talked before the show about the role that law and lawyers, you know, have had. Uh, in the years that you've covered. Well, I don't know all of the development of Hawaii, 19th century, 20th century, and now. And uh, some would argue that they've had too much, uh, too much, uh, uh, you know, to do with the development of the state. But that's the reality. I mean, I was there for part of it. I can tell you that lawyers had a, a lot to do with developing the state after statehood. They had a lot to do with, um, you know, the controversies, uh, the resolution of those controversies. Well, you know, Jay, being the daughter of a lawyer, I probably have a little bit more um, rose-colored glasses view of what lawyers do, though I didn't know as much when I started as I did when I finished. And for example, I interviewed Willie Moore, and he was the aviation lawyer uh, involved with getting uh, the first in Rogers Airport set up uh, in Honolulu. Mm -hmm. There, when Hawaii became a destination for jets, there was a lot of legal work that needed to be done. Am I right? Yes. Yeah. And he spoke of that on our show together, right right here, Think Tank. Yes. Yeah. yes. And, and then, of course, he became the lawyer who represented the rusting of Aloha Stadium. That's yes. a chapter in my book. <laughs> it's funny the way he tells it. So much you learn by talking to people just uh, 
talking story, oral history, if you will. That's what this is. This is, uh, you know, the reduction of the oral history to writing. And and then, you know, I, I want to talk about this a little bit. Um, you, you've, you've analyzed it. So out of these, say, 75 interview interview you did, you, you came up with um, a number of subjects. I have them listed here somewhere. And these subjects are really the most interesting list of subjects. Uh, and there are not as many of them. And so I surmise that what you did is you, you took the stories out of the interviews and you organized them into a short list of subjects. So now you have different voices of Hawaii talking about these subjects. And you know what it reminds me of? And I'll stop in a minute. You know, poo-poo dinner at Oahu Cemetery put on by the oh, yeah. mission houses? Yes, yes. There's vo these voices are coming from the past yeah. and, and, and they research everything people said in yes. that cemetery. And, and then they, they provide a, an analysis, a play of it and a discussion afterward. And, and the result is you, you, you meet the real people but then you see you, you have a kind of a, uh, it's, it's, it's Proustian. You're looking through the keyhole. You yeah. see into the dynamic of the development of the state through these, this evidentiary based kind of analysis. That's what you've done. That's a really great description, Jay. You have got it. You got it. That's, that's what it's been. So let me read some of them and uh, we can strike uh, some of them that you would talk about. Plantation stories, we want to know about that. The days of speaking Hawaiian, it's really part of the, it's, it's still a live issue. Uh, let, me stop, War, let me stop you right there. That was yeah. very interesting to me because I did not know the Hawaiian language had been outlawed uh, at one point in time uh, after the overthrow. And so I talked to people who told me that their grandparents spoke Hawaiian, but never spoke it to them and always spoke it behind closed doors and when they didn't want the kids to know what they were talking about. And uh, so many people talked about their experience of not knowing their own language. Broke my heart, but it was such an interesting story. And now alive and well, you know. So. And now alive and well. And of course, the resurgence of that is captured in some of my uh, parts in my book where I capture Puakea and Ogemeyer and other people who are teaching and promoting Hawaiian culture and language and dance and the whole thing. But here's one, I'm just skipping around your list, but. Here's one called Glass Ceilings. You know, we did a, a program um, of what they call the three digit lawyers. You know, uh, th these are the fellows who, and girls who um, uh, were assigned uh, numbers before the, the number 1000. And, you know, they, that, that's a long time ago. The three digit lawyers really built the state after statehood. And um, when you talk about glass ceilings, a lot of these lawyers uh, were, racially barred from participating in some of the big firms. Is that what you were talking about here in this analysis of glass? Yes, you got glass it exactly ceiling? right. My father was a three digit lawyer, by the way, but of course I don't think he faced the same kind of discrimination because he was Caucasian and uh, had a different life story. But I, one, the, one of the people who told that story really beautiful was Raymond Tam, who's a three digit lawyer. And he said, he had an experience of working for um, a company uh, before law school and they said, come back, you're a talented guy, we want you. And he came back after law school and said, here I am, give me the hardest cases, give me whatever you want, I'll prove myself. And they said, you know, we really like you, you're a really great guy, but we can't hire you because we don't hire Asians. He told that story on Think Tech. Yeah. Same story. Yeah. And it was something like, um, you know, we like you very much, but our clients, our clients wouldn't go along with it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Can you imagine? And, and, you know, he said, well, it turned out to be the best thing that ever happened to me because I went into a totally different aspect of law and yeah. against the people who wouldn't hire me and it worked out great for me. It did. It did. <laughs> it's a perfect result. Every, every problem is an opportunity. And here's one called um, Island Music. And that's always a favor of mine because you know, there's such a tremendous value in Hawaiian music and it's been a sine curve up and down, you know, it's just like the language. What did you cover in there? Well, uh, I, I interviewed um, Luana McKinney, who is part of Puamana uh, and, and her husband, and they told charming stories. So her story is in there. This really started because Steve Siegfried is a friend of mine. And I called Steve one day about four years ago and said, Steve, 
your story of Panini Records has never been told. And will you tell it now? And he said, yes. And so I sat with him over a series of three days and he told me his entire story. And he said, I think I want to write my own book. And I went, great, here, I'll transcribe all this. I'll give it to you all, here you go. But what I learned about Hawaiian music, about Panini Records, starting out with nothing but a dream, turning into being huge blockbuster. And then there's kind of a sad part of the story, but this part where they were, where they were at the apex, oh, it was so inspiring. And I was watching it happen at the time. And it was so exciting. And Witch Shingle, who was part of um, Panini Records, was my brother's best friend. So we kind of rode that journey with him. But the difference that Hawaiian music made to the entire Hawaiian Renaissance is, in my opinion, invaluable. And I capture a little bit of that story in my book. Yeah. So you have it, you know, it's, it's interesting. You pick the kind of the best parts of the, the, the traditions of Hawaii that have um, present themselves uh, that have evolved in our lifetimes. But there are other things that, that uh, your discovery did not touch. It, it didn't take you there. I mean, for example, um, you know, the people who are really poor, homeless, um, Pacific Islanders. Um, this is part of the story too. The, the difference is though, that you learned what you learned from people that were larger than life. They were known to the community. They were in the media. They, they had a, a, an active role in, in one enterprise or another. Um, the, the, the flip side is that a lot of people never have that active role. Hard to reach them. It's the, the spelunking experience doesn't take you there. What mm -hmm. about them? You're going to write another one about well, them? You know, it was sort of easy for me to reach the people at the higher echelon because I kept asking and kept getting referrals. When you think about going down to the uh, other end of the spectrum, it would take a lot of help for me to get to the people who had stories to tell. And I would be very interested in doing that. I would, I would love that. Uh, I, if, that, if that happens, I will follow that path. And someone, one, one person who I respect a lot, I don't think I'll use his name, but I really came to love him a lot, he said, I don't think Voices of Hawaii is a good name. I said, really? And because I had my heart set on it. I've been thinking about it, visualizing it. He said, no, because it doesn't capture all the voices of Hawaii. And I said, tell me more. And he said, there are people at the other end of the spectrum and you're not speaking for them. So these are not all the voices of Hawaii. And I went, that's true. This is not all the voices of Hawaii, which is what you're addressing. Am I right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah that's my point mm -hmm. or my inquiry anyway. There's so many other, uh, you know, touching topics here. How about agriculture and tourism? Uh, interesting that you should lump that up in one in one topic, um, but certainly both of them individually and uh, taken collectively um, have had an enormous effect on us and still do. And and maybe in some ways now these days in COVID and chaos, um, they are you know a vacuum for us. But what what was the story? Can you kind of uh, take us down that road? Thank you for asking. That story started with uh, Jim Case, who grew up on a plantation and then became a lawyer later in his life and um, very active in the community. And he was so sad about the demise of the, the sugar industry. He wanted it to continue in Hawaii, but found that it couldn't. And so he told his story about that. And that is one of the things I capture in there. And then it turned out other people talked about the value of tourism and the declining productivity of agriculture. And they seemed to find a way to fit together. So I put them together. See, I told you it was creative trying to figure out what my topics were. So I did a, a combination there. Well, the, the totally related and all that. And they, and they lead to, um, you know, the examination of the diversification of the economy and what are we going to do now and yeah i mean this opens all kinds of you know you can't you can't go into the future without knowing where you are now and and, and it, it, a lot of it has to do with with simple factors of productivity and trade and so on um, sugar was no longer prosperous as it had been and it was so labor intensive and required such uh mm, demeaning conditions for some people that it no longer was an appealing industry to be in, in my opinion. I'm, I'm speculating there. Well, I mean, the reality has shown. 
Um, but then you have one called the philanthropy, which I think is interesting. It goes back to the question of the trusts. You mentioned before the show that yes. you know trusts are such a big part of Hawaii and, yes. and still are. Yes. And philanthropy is related to the trust. And, and uh, that, that movie, uh, we talked about it. The uh, Descendants. The Descendants was part of that with the, the valley that was held in trust under the rule against perpetuities. Only somebody knew. Oh, that's, that's what it was. The man who wrote uh, Perpetuities in a Nutshell is the one who was uh, my father and <laughs> Frank Padgett's uh, in, instructor at Harvard. <laughs> Small world, yeah. coast to coast. Yeah. Anyway, so what, what, was the, what was the thing there? You have philanthropy as a special animal in Hawaii. It's a well, that kind of started as in my paying homage to um, Dwayne Steele, who, who was very dear to our family when my father was sick uh, and would be on the lanai just resting. He was dying. Dwayne would show up every day at two o'clock. Sometimes he'd have his ukulele. Sometimes he'd just bring his voice and he would just sit and be with my father. And we all got to either be there or go rest. And I can't speak highly enough of Dwayne. And then I began to find out some of his story and all the things he did and his passion and ways that he contributed to the community. And it was such a beautiful philanthropic story that I had about him, that that's where it started. And then there's many other people who have been generous in our community and I was able to capture them too. That strikes me, Jane. We didn't talk about this uh, last time, but you did know and you do know a lot of the witnesses, so to speak, in this book. And you're, you know, you 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 shared parts of Hawaii history and nostalgia. They go hand in hand with them. And uh, here you are, uh, chatting with them, talking story with them, writing it down, analyzing it, making a book out of it. You you must have had, as as I have had, the experience of of having your own personal memories you know, flood through your mind while you were doing this. Your whole life really uh, is touched by these various stories. It is, it is not only their stories or our stories, it is your stories. You were there. How do you feel about that? What was your emotional experience about that? Oh, that's such a good question. You know that my profession is as a licensed uh, psychotherapist. And so Maybe the difference in how I interviewed women was a little bit what you do, is I would go down to a deeper level. I didn't just want to know what they did, what they did next. Tell me about it. Tell me how you felt about it. And as I drew out their impassioned responses to my questions, I felt my heart being touched. It was, it was, it was a growth experience for me because my memories, you can imagine my memories are encapsulated like this. Somebody gives me more data or more context in how this event happened and my memory and my experience begins to grow. And I try and put that in the book so the book is sort of a, an expanding experience. Yeah. I'm reminded of the, the great books uh, that have been written to connect the threads, you know. Uh, the great history book that I read when I was flying out here, uh, well, 1965, was mm -hmm. Michener, Hawaii. And then it was Hawaii Pono. There was Land and Power. Remember all these books? And, and frankly, Jane, I would put your book right in there. It, it is a, it is a, a very heartfelt uh, and personal story, um, but it also, you know, puts puts things together, and it gives, um, you know, a picture, a, a touchy touchy feely picture of how we behaved and how we behave uh -huh. now. You see, that, that part really matters to me. I'm so glad that you see that, that you mentioned that, because I, I, I read stories, you know, people try and talk about Hawaii and they use all the words and they use you know, the common descriptors and the poly and the this and the that, but the feel of the people who lived it is, is, is so important to give context and meaning. It's more personal. Yeah, it is. So uh, some of these topics, um... I really have to ask you about because I really don't know. I don't know about some of these things. Um, you know, for example, uh, well, I know this only at distance, voices of the ranchers. Now, if you said voices of the plantation, Luna, uh, you know, I could, I, could, I could relate to that, but voices, the, the ranchers were a special breed entirely. 
Well, you know, will the Cowboys and the Ranchers be friends or whatever that song was? From was Oklahoma. From Oklahoma, yeah. <laughs> but what do you know about ranchers here and why should we care about what happened to the ranchers? I did not know very much about ranchers, but I have a soft spot in my heart because uh, part of my family in Montana, they are ranchers. So I know about it in person. I've been there. I've worked on the ranch with them. So when I get a chance to interview the ranchers in Hawaii, they tell me about how the land was used, uh, how they inherited the land, how they preserved it, how they kept it profitable, how they honored the wishes of the generation that gave it to them and worked at keeping it prosperous for the generation that would inherit it. A fascinating story. And so I'm not only learning about cows and horses, I'm learning about land use, best land use practices. And I'm not only learning about that, but Corky Bryan was one of my favorite interviewees. And he said, you know, we had trouble at Parker Ranch trying to figure out how to make everybody work together because these guys, you know, the Paniolo structure was very hierarchical. The guys at the top had better conditions than the guys at the bottom, but we wanted to make it more horizontal. So what we did is we gave each guy a little kuleana to take care of, and it was their responsibility. And if they needed help, they had to go to these guys. And so they need to be available when these guys came to them for help. So the whole story of how they got uh, a Hawaiian man to come and um, talk story with, the, with, the, with all the Paniolos to teach them how to do it the Hawaiian way, which is more horizontal than hierarchical. Oh, God, it was an awesome story. Oh, it's, it's an awesome topic. Uh, so I wanted to, you know, this is a hard one. Can I ask you a hard question? Yeah. You know, you have how many stories here and 75 witnesses to bear the stories. Um, and you're talking about that same historic period. What was the most significant thread? What was the most significant driver that took us to where we are today? You know, I said in the last interview, you know, I'm, I'm just the story collector. I'm not the sage. I'm not the biggest know-it-all. <laughs> I don't know if I, I don't know if I'm smart enough to answer that question. But certainly the uh, the cultural integration was part of it. The the blending of of mixed cultures was part of it. These this hierarchical thing that I'm talking about, the people at the top and the people at the bottom, how they all fit in and where. Oh, one of the story, one of the themes that I love the most, I don't know if this answers your question, was I talked to many people who came over as immigrants, their grandparents, parents came over as immigrants, and then three generations later, their sons or daughters are the head CEOs of Hawaiian corporations. It just touches your heart. And I have so many stories of what I call upward ascension. Oh, that was so interesting to me. I, I, I just couldn't get enough of it. It's very important. And it's something you wouldn't know unless you studied it. And you'd have to find people who would be willing to tell you about it. There's a lot and of- why uh, these people, why these people opened up to me? I have no idea, uh, but it, it, it was spectacular, I will tell you. Well, it's the, the barrier of the sacred cow in a way. We have sacred cows and there are some things that you really have to work to learn about, you know? <clears throat> so I think that people, people would be interested in, uh, in putting your book on their table, of taking a look at it, of seeing the stories, and and um, you know appreciating. Let me say, let me say one final thing. We're doing a soft opening in December, in case anybody wants it for the holidays. If they will let us know, either Watermark Publishing or myself, if they will let us know by November thirtieth, we can get it to them by the holidays. Oh, Otherwise, a, the big openings in January, and everybody can have as many as they want in January. It's a great gift. But here, um, so it'll be on Amazon, I take it? It will be in January. Right now it's available with Watermark or you can do it on my website, voicesofhawaii.com. In, in, making, in making the decision to buy this book, to give this book as a gift, I think it's really important uh, for people to understand your poetry. And mm -hmm. therefore, I mean, they, they have heard you speak today as, and if they go back and look at what we talked about, I think in April, um, they can see your poetry there. But I wonder if you could read the last paragraph of the book for us. The last paragraph. And yes. Give people the idea of what your poetry sounds like. Can oh, you do that? yes. I, do, I will say one caveat that the 
words in this book are primarily the words of the people who spoke them. I just put them together. But the epilogue is mine. Is that what you're talking about, the epilogue? Yes, whatever, whatever you choose, really. Um, it's as though somebody is interviewing me and it says, um, since I already have approval from my interviews, I could put them all together and make these interview transcripts available. Um, and then they say, and, and did I hear you say that you'd do it again? Uh, does that mean we might look forward to Voices of Hawaii Part 2? And Jane Goodsill says, I would love that. Think of how many stories are still out there to be told and how many people for me yet to meet. I'm convinced that when people talk heart to heart, there is a bond created and we become part of the same tribe. I want more of this in my life and more of this in the world. Oh, so fine. I'm so glad I asked you. <laughs> that was a great question. You should have told me ahead of time to be prepared, though. <laughs> so, sorry about that, Jane. But maybe sometimes surprises are good for you. <laughs> yeah. Thanks for asking. Jane Marshall Goodsell, author. It's, uh, it's the stories of Hawaii. And today we've been listening to the stories of Hawaii. And uh, we know more about them. And we look forward to your when your book comes out. And we wish you well in promoting it. Thank you so much. Aloha. Thank you. Aloha. Aloha.